thanks again, Sean, for having me. I hope everyone is well and safe uh, wherever you are uh, across the globe. Uh, so yeah, like Sean said, currently uh, with uh, NYCFC and discussing here today uh, development in in the pre professional phase. So the objective of, of the talk, and uh, I hope to have a, a decent amount of time for Q and A at the end, is just to provide an insight into the development in the pre professional phase. Uh, you know, the agenda will, will include a little introduction, uh, my role, my current role, uh, a little bit of background and, and philosophy on on my time in the coaching field. And then I'll break down the, uh, the focus into to three components. Talk about player development, uh, you know, how we bridge the gap from academy to uh, first team environment, and then how we manage the movement. And a lot of the context will be based on our unique situation, uh, which may be different, obviously, from a lot of teams, you know, in Europe and different than from other teams in the MLS as well. So, and then, like I said, we'll open up at the end to some, some Q&A. Uh, so I hope to leave a decent amount of time for that. So, like I said, uh, NYCFC's current U19 head coach, and I also lead the 15 to 19s uh, performance phase. Uh, I've been with the club now going on, on five years, and I've always coached in the oldest age group. Uh, we started the academy with uh, one team and then went to 14s and 16s. And then when we went to a full-fledged academy with the 19s, I, I was in, until the league folded recently, I was in my third year uh, with the 19s. And uh, as Sean alluded to, uh, we had some success uh, in the past two years, uh, you know, winning the, the national championship uh, in, our, in our first two years. So a big achievement for the club, uh, for the players and everyone involved. So, you know, my philosophy, you know, I thought I'd little touch on that a little bit. Obviously, it's very relevant. So, you know, within, within my philosophy, I think uh, it's important to know that development is always first, uh, you know, Winning is not as expected in regard to the, pr the pressure that's put on winning, especially in our environment. You know, in, end, in the end, I think it's a byproduct. So, you know, we, we won't sacrifice development over winning. Uh, and, and going back to a little bit of background of, of myself, uh, you know, I, I, I now work with the Professional MLS Academy. I previously worked in, in the club team in, in the DC metro area, uh, in Maryland specifically. And, uh, you know, and I, I know. Sean was going to ask some questions towards the end about some of the some of the players I work with, uh, but just to provide a little context, uh, you know, both I, I would I would break it down to two main groups of players I've worked with that have been successful and, and gone on to play at the next level. Uh, the first the first being, you know, the OBGC Rangers team in, in the Maryland area, where I think there's around five now playing professional. I think from one team, about around eight of them went on to the professional ranks. So. You know, that was a, where I kind of applied my trade as a coach and, and, and learned a lot uh, in action and, and on action in regards to how to develop players. Uh, and, and as a result, you know, winning became a byproduct. And then a lot of these players went on to play in, in different leagues. Uh, some of them mostly in the MLS, but some went to Europe. And, uh, and now, obviously, with my, my role with the NYCFC, the, the pressure has never been to win. Uh, winning came. It took a little bit of time, uh, but it did come. And it came in, you know, with, with development as the priority always. Uh, you know, with regard to how the, the style I like and how, uh, you know, how, how, how the system is going to be, I think it obviously goes into to what we have with regard to the players. You know, I think the principles always remain the same and, and I always want to try and play a similar style. Uh, but, but we have to be flexible. Uh, I know for the first, first year we had success, we had a different team to the second year. You know, we had to adapt. Uh, the first year we had a lot of technical players and very young, so physically it was a challenge. So we needed the ball as much as possible, uh, and so we, we were a little bit more possession orientated, a little bit more team focused. And you know, the second year we had some some real pace in certain areas, and we became a little bit more uh, direct for 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 what, for a certain style we needed. And you know, direct still with the same principle and identity of trying to build and trying to play. And, and we just tried to stretch teams a little bit more because we had some real pace. So, uh, like I said, flexible, always based on the talent and the strengths of the group and, and always trying to get the best out of the individuals to reach their potential within that, that group dynamic. Uh, you know, within that, it's always a clearly defined style and identity. Once again, it takes time. You know, you need buy-in from the group, you need sacrifice and commitment. Uh, and, and as a coach, I, I, you know, I'm always developing as a coach. I've been coaching for many years and, and I think with regard to my coaching 
kind of journey, it's, uh, it's what do I also want to become as, as I continue. So, you know, being a leader has become more, more relevant in my current domain, you know, having a larger staff and working within a group, whereas previously it was more uh, individual based, you know, just myself, and maybe one of the coaches to help out. So just being a unit of a leader, you know, observing and communicate openly and listen to players and, and staff alike. I think over time I've learned to be more composed, especially on the sideline. Uh, I think you can make better decisions. Uh, being emotionally stable also, I think is important for players and being less reactive to situations. And once again, you know, just, just progressive. And, and, you know, I think we have a duty within the US to try and uh, develop creative players, uh, you know, be different, be pioneering. That The landscape is, is, is a little bit different than maybe a lot of other countries, uh, you know, and, and I grew up in the UK and I moved across to the States uh, maybe 20 years ago. So I have, I've, I've you know, come into contact with, with various cultures in regard to, to the game itself. And I've seen the game of soccer in the US grow massively. And I think, uh, I think we, we're striving to find those, those world-class players and looking to develop those players that can, can engage people in the game. And obviously within the US, there's a lot of uh, competition for, for sports. So we have to be progressive. We have to be pioneering and creative and brave. And I think, I always try and get that across to, to, to players and, and, and how we play and, and the style we, we embody. So, you know, with that, we obviously create uh, a strong team culture and, and we look to lead by example, you know, and we'll touch on these as we go through the presentation, but uh, they're in there now just with the values, elite behaviors, uh, development always to the forefront and the togetherness of a group and how important that can be. And, and once again, being progressive in, in, our, in, our, in our nature. So as we as I discussed, the uh, I'll break it into three components with regard to what we do in the uh, the pre professional phase. You know, once again, first and foremost, it's, it's about player development. We have to develop the players. So throughout the academy, we're looking to develop players to the highest level of their potential and prepare them for the first team. Uh, within that, we work uh, a lot on individual development plans. We we'll to maximise the individual talent, the potential of each one, knowing that everyone is different. So we have to cater for everyone's needs. Uh, you know, the non-negotiables and fundamentals are in everything we do. And, I, and once again, I'll, I'll go through some of these, uh, some of these slides so you can get a, a greater uh, amount of detail in these. Uh, always look to support and enhance development of each player. And then how do we do that within a game, games program? You know, the game experience for us is, is, is vital to, to challenge them to make the jump, uh, to challenge them to get uh, from our academy into, into our first team environment. And, you know, I, I, we don't have a second team, so it's a big jump. We have a very strong roster and a, and a high-level MLS team, so it's an even bigger challenge to develop, you know, a player within the academy that can get, jump across and, and play with the first team. So we have a lot of challenges in regard to bridging that gap. Uh, so we have to really focus on on player development and really break it down so that we can try and develop the best amount of uh, potential from, from players. We are fortunate that we have a, a very good talent pool in the New York area, obviously a very diverse area, highly populated, uh, we have our challenges for sure, uh, but we have the talent, so we have to really try and nurture that and try and get the most out of it. We are, once again, a, a, a very young academy uh, and, and, we're, and, a, and a young club within the MLS, so we're still in our founding years and we've still got a lot of work to do, but we've had some success from, from development of players in the academy that have progressed into the first team environment. So just to touch on our development overview, overview here, a little snapshot on you know our, our objectives uh, as discussed is to produce players for the first team you know to be, produce players for for the highest level uh, as we can and and, and inter not just the MLS but internationally so that we can uh, make an impact with our first team and beyond. Uh, what in addition to that it has to be we have to produce outstanding people you know uh, and if you look down through the slides it's it's our, our, our focus is not just on the players and the person as well. And, uh, and, and the staff are at the forefront of the development, so we have to produce uh, outstanding staff. So whilst players have individual development programs, the staff do as well. And it's, uh, it's a very strong approach we have with regard to that. So if you look at the, the, uh, the, this chart here, it shows that we have the objectives, the, the, the program, the culture, and the, the general work, and the characteristics that make that up. Uh, the values we've talked about in the culture, and then if you go down to the bottom, there's the negotiables and the fundamentals that, that are in everything we do. And these are really important that we, that we get across and they are daily reminders of what we need to do uh, to develop players within, within our, our system and style to progress through to the first team. The pathway, you know, we understand that the pathway is, 
is never linear. You know, pl players go through different uh, ups and downs, and 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 every player is unique. You know, and especially within US, uh, there's there's options to go by a college. Uh, there's options to play, uh, you know, abroad, and, and and through that, it's it's the competition that's important. And you know, there's a lot of success that players will have along the way, and there are, there are a lot of challenges. And it's about you know balancing those and uh, making the most of each player's individual qualities. And once again charting their, their progression and charting their development so that we understand as they get closer to uh, potential first team, you know, where are they at and where do they need to go? You know, we are, obviously we're very fortunate within the city group. We have, uh, you know, partners and, and all across the globe, you know, obviously Man City probably being the highest level one, but uh, clubs in, in China, Japan, in, in Uruguay, in Spain and in Australia. So we have the opportunity to send players uh, to get experiences Obviously, within the U.S. soccer landscape, college is a is a pathway. And whilst we haven't had many players via college because it's such the infancy of our program, we do have players in college programs that we hold in high regard, and we believe that at some point they may be a professional player for us. So we have to be be aware of the, the college program as well. Uh, we have to be aware of all the different avenues that we can we can use to to get players uh, ultimately into our first team. With regard to the IDPs that I touched on, I'll, I'll just give you a snapshot so you can get an idea of, uh, of what the IDP entails and, and how we work with, with each player. Each player within the 15 to 19s has a specific IDP program. And in the younger age groups as well, they have their own uh, version of this. So, you know, with regard to the IDP, it's a lot on the player and it's a lot on how they, how they uh, can progress and, and utilize this tool uh, with aid of the coaches, the staff, their teammates and uh, other external factors. So. After we set the goals and objectives, we put it into an action plan. Uh, then it has to be implemented in the training and the games and in, in the daily life. Uh, we understand the barriers that are, that are included, and then we look to review it and, and look to review it and update it and look to make sure it's relevant. And, and it's always changing. It's an ever changing uh, program. So as we go through this, this IDP, I just, once again, I'm happy to share this on, on another platform at another time uh, and discuss further, but obviously conscious of time. So we'll, We'll go through what it looks like. Uh, you know, each player gets a passport they fill in. This is a player I, I took out the photograph and the, and, and the name, etc., and some of the detail. But a player we had in the academy in the older age groups. And as we as we fill out the passport, we move into what we we believe is, is important. It's the, the goal setting. So uh, making sure that the the smart, measurable goals, and we go with uh, you know short term, long term goals. So the, we break the season in half, what, what we're looking for in the first half, and then in the second half, uh, progression to that, medium term, one to three years, and then a longer term in, in three plus years. So I think this player in specific, which is why I use this, he was, he was very uh, realistic at his level. He was very realistic in, in where he was, but he had, he had big goals, uh, and, and he, he dreamt very big. And we talk about dreaming big and, and, and being able to try and, work towards those but he was realistic in his current level and his and, he, and you know his first half of the season he just wanted to fight for a starting position you know he was a younger player he was less physically developed uh he wasn't uh you know uh, one of our elite talent national team players uh but he had self-belief and he has quality so with that he 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 talked about fighting for his position and then the second half of the season you know earning his position and it was important that we understood where he was at. So each player grades themselves and then the coach will also grade them. And it's less about the grades, it's just kind of a reference point. So, you know, while we're not always huge on grades, it's, it's a good reference point for the, the IDP process. Uh, after they've graded themselves, we, we, the coach will grade them and then we'll sit together. And if you look at the, the grading, it's, it's, it's pretty aligned. Uh, we break, out, break it down into, into four areas, the technical, tactical, psychosocial and physical four components and they'll grade themselves and this is you know this evolves over time this this uh, idp you're constantly changing and we're always updating it uh so this even from last preseason has been updated but i thought i'd give you a snapshot of what it was like and uh once again it's it's, it's understanding where the players view themselves with regard to the coach and then kind of finding a common ground so there's there can be room for improvement and room for, for the ability to work together uh, so he, this player once again was you get a good realistic view of where he was at uh, a lot of the grades are very in sync and it allowed us to, to connect on, on what the future would hold for this player. We break down the, the action plan, three, three objectives we, we, we work on over 
you know, maybe four to six weeks, five to six weeks. And we do that probably five times a year. Uh, and sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the player, depending on the age group. So they'll come up with the learning objective, we'll tweak, we'll guide them if needed. Uh, and then they'll, they'll discuss how they'll work on it. Uh, who can help them with this, uh, depending on what the objective is. They can be technical, tactical, some can be physical. Uh, and then we'll work on this over time. And we, ha we encourage them and we guide them to, to, to take this on. So is it before practice? Is it after practice? Uh, is it outside of practice? Who do they need to, to fulfill these, these development and action plans? Uh, you know, and our dynamic, you know, is very different because within our academy, we have very little space. You know, we operate with, uh, with one field for our six academy teams. So there's not always time before, there's not always time after. Uh, so we have to be really creative with these action plans and really creative with how we want to implement them. Obviously, there's barriers. So we discussed the barriers that could come into place with regard to the IDPs, the injuries, social media, distractions, the pressure of what you do and don't want to do and, and any unexpected situations and excuses that, that may come up. And then we have an informal review. Uh, like I say, the time frame changes. It could be four weeks, could be six weeks, depending on the part of the season. Uh, we'll see where they are, where they learn objectives. We'll adapt them, we'll change them. Uh, we may continue them, uh, depending on, on where we feel it's relevant. This actually is an example of, uh, of our current IDP, which if you look at the title, it's, obviously it's an IDP example of what, what's going on in the COVID uh, situation. We are doing a lot of IDP works with the players, but knowing that in the New York City area, it's very, very uh, different for each player. Uh, they come from different variety of backgrounds. We don't, we don't know whether everyone has access to the right amount of, of space or whether it's safe. So we're trying to adapt and, and cater to, to those needs. So. Uh, this is just an example of what we've done for a 30 day diary for players. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it just gives you an idea of their objectives that are in there. You know, a little chart of what they can work on over time, how often they can work on it. Uh, and then, then we're in con constant communication with the players in different forums, you know, individually or small groups, uh, larger groups, and looking to just keep them connected because this time is really important for them to, to take on some of their ownership of their development, given such the time away from, from their team. Uh, so the, the staff have just spent a lot of time working towards uh, a variety of, of IDPs. And this, once again, is just a snapshot of, of what a 30-day diary would look like uh, during our, our current uh, situation. So now as we, as we go on to the second part of, uh, second part of, the, of the component, you know, with regard to the development phase, we've talked about the development aspects. Now it's about how do we... How do we bridge the gap? You know, how do we bridge the gap with regard to, you know, the players uh, who are now looking to get from, from our academy uh, into, into the first team? So a little context of our setup, uh, once again, new academy. Uh, we don't currently have uh, an MLS second team, a USL team. So the, the gap that that often, often would, would bridge uh, is not there at this current moment in time. Limited space and resources with regard to, to, to what we have available for training. Uh, you know, it's New York City. Uh, once again, we have a lot of talent, but very limited space. So uh, we have our challenges for sure. And within the academy, we have to be creative. So that's the context with regard to our setup. And now it's, you know, how do we deal with that? Uh, <clears throat> we're very fortunate. We have a huge connection with the first team staff, uh, you know, going back to when, when Patrick Vieira was, was, was involved. He was very, very interested in bringing in the young players. So even early on, when we only had a U16 team, uh, he was still bringing those players in. You know, during international breaks, if 12 players got called up for an international break, 12 players were brought in for the academy, you know, 14, 15, 16-year-olds. And uh, that was a fantastic uh, opportunity for players, but also for, for the connection between, you know, the academy and the first team and also the, the staff, the connection between the style. Uh, the connection between the, the principals and, and there was always an open dialogue uh, with, with regards to what was going on. So what we decided to do as the teams got older, uh, we decided, uh, you know, with the support of the first team, and we decided to kind of mirror certain areas. You know, we separated the 19s from the other academy age groups who would purely focus on certain development pathway. And we started to mirror the first team with regard to, uh, you know, even some of their set piece set up and, you know, how they, how they protected the goal, for instance, you know, uh, Vieira worked, worked sometimes on zone defending in the goal. So we, we thought it would be challenging for the players to try something different. And we also thought it would allow them the best opportunity that when they stepped onto the training field, 
they had less to think about with regard to the tactics and the styles and the systems and, and the principles and more about uh, just being sharp, you know, just being uh, maybe less stressed about what to think about. So a little bit of freedom and, and, and fluidity in what they're doing. And we noticed that they, they performed a lot better. So, so a lot of the work we did with the 19s, you know, going back to the, to the first year where, where they had some success with the national championship, they, a lot of the stuff we did was, was mirror the first team, you know, how we pressed different scenarios, uh, you know, mirrored the first team, how we built different scenarios once again, mirrored the first team. And, and it really allowed us to challenge the players to get them out of their comfort zone. And some of the stuff they were doing, they, they would see on a, on a regular basis with, with the first team in the games. And it really connected the group. So uh, there, was, there was a lot of open dialogue. You know, as a, as a staff member of the academy, I was open to, to all the meetings with the, with the first team uh, training. I would, I would watch, watch training, observe training, just talk to the staff. Uh, we had lost the first team staff members would come down to training, help out, watch. Uh, going back, even back a few years, you know, did this, the first team coach, you know, Bear Bear would come to games standing on the sideline, come in the locker room. And what it did, it really connected and it bridged the gap that we, that we didn't have with, with a potential second team, with a potential MLS2 team at, at that point in time. So very fortunate, you know, Dominic continued this uh, constant progression of players being brought in from the academy to the first team, constant uh, training opportunities, uh, pre-season. You know, every pre-season we, we send six to ten academy players uh it's a real eye opener for them it's fantastic for the development it's fantastic for the club and it allows us to really push push players and push the uh push the, the development of each player so you know that has been really fortunate for the club and and you know that continues today with with the new staff coming in once again we uh we had a big group of players with the pre-season they were very fortunate in the fact that that they had uh some high level games lined up and Given the break that MLS has, the players were, you know, the first team players were not really physically ready to play uh, against, you know, and we had two Brazilian teams, Palmeiras, Corinthians, we had lined up to play. So they needed the academy players and they threw in 10 academy players against the Brazilian high level team. And, and uh, the goal was just to keep the scoreline down. And the, the boys did fantastic. Ended up, I think, we were, we were two, two zero down when they threw in 10 academy players. And we just hoped it stayed in single digits. Uh, Ended up 2-1, you know, so the Academy boys, you know, pulled the goal back and really represented the club well. And, and, and just to see the connection, I was fortunate enough to be with the first team for that, for that pre-season trip. And just to see the connection with the players and the first team players uh, and the Academy players and the staff, it really does, you know, it's a special bond that, that, that's been created throughout the club. Uh, you know, it started from Claudio and it went all the way through. So, you know, the connection and bridging the gap has been there. And, and I think we're very fortunate in that respect. Uh, you know. In order to get the players ready for these opportunities, the, the culture and the elite behaviours that are required are really pushed in the older age groups. Obviously, they're introduced to the younger agents, but they're really pushed. We, we, we want to make, make sure that when they step into a first team environment, when, they, when they're there in the first team locker room, that they are you know, respectful, they're ready, uh, they're professional, and, and that they, they, they can take care of business. So we basically want to provide the best opportunity so that once they're on the field, they just have to be ready to train. You don't have to think too much about the tactical aspect because that's been covered. Uh, it's been, you know, worked on for months on the training field and, and put into games. Uh, the culture and elite behaviors has been, we've been pushed in the academy so that that's there. Uh, and then they just have to be, you know, mentally fresh as possible. And, you know, once again, with, with regards to the, the requirements, we then start to push, you know, the requirement of, of winning in the 19s uh, as well without sacrificing our development beliefs, but winning, you know, is, is more relevant. So how to find, uh, you know, games that, that can challenge them. So we play a lot of men's teams. Uh, you know, we probably play 10 or 12 men's teams just to give them a different idea of, of, of what, what the game is like. Uh, physically, a little bit different. Uh, styles, obviously different. And then you're playing against, you know, players that are 10, 15 years, maybe older than you that have played at a decent level. And, and uh, the last thing I want to do is chase around a young academy kid. So, it's, uh, it's just a different mental challenge we give them. Uh, we try and give them international experience as much as we can. Uh, we always try and play them up if possible. You know, we try and just do things differently so that we're, we're able to, uh, once again, bridge the gap. And, and, once again, and sometimes it's fortunate enough to play a friendly scrimmage against the first team when they need a tune-up or when they need, uh, you know, some of the, uh, some of the maybe reserve first team players need to tune up. And, and those have always been very advantageous to the academy. And I think, uh, eye opening to at times the first team because it, once again the boys are always prepared for that and they're always up for it 
and it allows them uh, the opportunity to, uh, to, to showcase and get, get a taste for what's next. So we talk about culture a lot. Uh, what defines our culture? Uh, you know, it's the, the shared objectives we have and the values and behaviors that define what we do in, in, within this, the staff and the players. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's values and behaviors that we, we instill on a daily basis. So we're, we're big on culture. Uh, over time, it's really grown, and, and you get to see that now with players who have maybe moved on into college. They're still very connected to the club. Players who've been homegrown are still very connected to the academy and come down, always, you know, show their face to train if they can. Uh, they'll do a lot of these Zoom calls that we're doing right now. So they're very well connected, and, and this is something that we're really big on, is developing not just the player, uh, but developing the person as well. And if they go hand in hand, I think we've, we've, we've done our job. It's, we want to really challenge them, but we want to really care for them, and we want to have make sure that they they uh, understand the values and they're important. The elite behaviors, which we touched on, uh, just to go in a little bit more detail, there's a few on here, I'm not gonna narrate every one, but uh, it's important here, we have have clear goals, you know, and, and, we, and we've, we're always looking to be obsessive in what we do. Uh, and clean feedback at the bottom is a big one for us, can, you know, the, the clean feedback of, of what each player can, can get and give uh, we really try and open things up so that they're part of the process and you know we're very lucky to have uh, a lot of players who've been through been through the academy and then gone into the first team and they can they can embody these elite behaviors throughout so now we talked obviously about the, the player development side of it we talked about bridging the gap and our, our context and our, our challenges and our uh, obviously you know the connection with the first team. Now it's, it's about the managing the movement. Uh, with regard to the movement of players, it's, it's quite easy to send players up in regard to, to motivating them uh, and, and keeping them connected. It's, it's often a challenge then for them to come back down, you know, come back down into the environment and after training and playing with the likes of David Villa and, and, and Villo and Maxi and, and some of the top high level players we have and have, have had on the first team over the years. Uh, to then come down back down to our you know six teams on one field uh academy environment which is uh you know obviously a very busy environment and lots of people coming and going so how do they then deal with that and and uh i'll discuss you know james sands as a, as a case study example he was our first homegrown player and he's been through this journey and and you know he embodied it and, and really came out on the other end so we hope it's going to be the same for the players and, until we're able to bridge the gap, but it's, uh, it's not always the case, you know, so, you know, I'll discuss a little bit more a little bit about James as, as a case study example, and then just once again, touch on the, on the culture expectations and then, you know, what we look to do and hopefully how we can, you know, manage the movement further down the line. So here we have uh, the club values that we, that we embody and, you notice a picture there of, of James, and James was and, and is our first homegrown. So, you know, we talk about integrity. Uh, you know, and having the courage and honesty and resilience to do the right thing 100% of the time. <clears throat> so this was a player who, you know, made his debut at 16, uh, came off the bench, I think, for, for Pirlo in a, in a, in a tournament in, in South Central South America, and really progressed from there. But then came the time where he needed some minutes, you know, then came the time when he needed to, you know, train with the academy and play with the academy. So uh, at that point in time, when Vieira was the, the manager, uh, we mapped out, you know, what his development looked like. You know, physically, he wasn't ready for the MLS. So he did a lot of physical work on the side. Uh, and, and, you know, game time was, was a challenge for him. So we mapped out very closely the time he would spend with us. Uh, leading to games, uh, we discussed whether a game was beneficial or whether a small group training with the first team was more beneficial regarding the, the load, the distance to travel, the level of competition. Uh, you know, sometimes we had to challenge, challenge him in different positions. You know, sometimes we played him a little bit higher up. Uh, you know, so he was a player that really took it on though and, and embodied these, these, these four values, his discipline, his competitiveness and respect. You know, he came down to train and, and literally the first on the training pitch, you know, uh, he'd get on as soon as he could. If there was space to get on, he'd get on. If not, he'd find a space behind the goal off the side. You know, training's done. Uh, we, we, you know, we're trying to pack up. Tra we, we train late, so players got to get back to, to their homes and, and get ready for school the next day. So he was, you know, always the last on the field. Uh, you'd have to kick him off at times. 
And, you know, his, his character was unbelievable. And he, he never complained. He, he just fought in every training, you know, got 100% in. He respected all his teammates. He respected the coaching staff. Uh, and he would go back and forth and back and forth to the first team into the academy. And then actually he got a run of games, uh, you know, run of games over the winter when the MLS season finished. And he was with us for, for a good month. And then back with the first team preseason, once again, in his second year, uh, needed some minutes. So we, then we kind of t- tailored it to where we played, you know, top MLS teams and, and more international competitions so that his game programs was a little bit more challenging. And, uh, and he actually came all the way through and, uh, those who don't know, he actually scored the winning PK in the first national develop, uh, and national championship game. You know, after extra time, so against LA Galaxy, it was it was great for him. It was it was his last game for us. That's what we hoped at the time, and, and he actually ended up being because uh, we, we knew he was ready to make the jump. But you know, he's a player that even I think up until last season, uh, when he was you know two or three years into the club, he would still text me during the long MLS winter breaks when they would take you know a few months off and they weren't allowed to train. And he would text me, you know, begging to come to training with the academy. And I had to get permission, you know, I'd tell him, go get permission for the first team staff before, you know, before I, I say yes and make sure they're okay with it. And they were, so he would be training with us. And, and just to see him come into the training session, all the young guys would be looking around because now at this point, he was more of an established player. He's played for the first team a bunch of times. Uh, and he didn't change. Once again, first one there, last to leave. 100% of all time, super competitive, obsessive in every every aspect of his game, uh, always looking to do the right thing. And he, and he was a quiet leader, you know, he was a very quiet young man, uh, but he gained respect from everyone because of how he trained. And I think what he did, he, he set the standard, he set the standard for the academy players, he set the standard for uh, uh, other players within the system to, to really take on and to really push through what, what you know, what he wanted to do. and, and He's been a great example of the club, and now he's a very, you know, I don't want to put pressure on him, but he's, he's an established player within our first team. And, uh, you know, before the break, he was, he was really finding good form. So, uh, you know, hope he can continue that. Uh, but a great example for us to have, and, and he's kind of the, the poster boy snapshot of the academy because he, he embodies all the club values we talk about. He embodies, you know, everything else we talk about in regards to player development and, and the person and the character. Uh, and he has gone through the journey. and, and to do what, what he's done, and other players now had to do the same. You know, we had Joe Scali and Tavon Gray and Justin Hack, other professional homegrowns that have had to spend a lot of time in the academy because uh, they haven't had the, the opportunity to play or go alone at, at this point in time. And, and uh, they always look up to James still. And, and, you know, I all I have to do is reference how he was when they were playing, and, and it's a perfect example. Uh, and so, you know, like I said, very fortunate, and he's, he's a great uh, role model. For everyone in the academy, and continues to do so on a, on a daily basis. So, like I said, I want to leave a lot of time to to, to Q and A uh, because you know there's there's different uh, areas of the game I've worked within and different levels that I've worked with. And I know Sean Sean knows a little bit about my background. So, uh, just to go in a little bit in reverse order because I, I skipped through that at the, at the beginning was uh, you know I, I spent time. Uh, in, in the DC metro area. Uh, after growing up in England, I moved over to the US to, on a scholarship. And so I spent half my life in the US and, and coached in, in many different levels. Uh, I worked with a club in, in, in Maryland. And like I said, it was from a small town team that was together for a long time. I think eight, eight ended up in the professional ranks, uh, which was very unique. I don't know if it will happen again. And uh, five, I think, now uh, in around the MLS ranks. Still very connected with a lot of them. Uh, one of them actually, Gideon Zalalem, who went to Arsenal at a young age, actually full circle now. He's back with in the MLS and he's in, with, with NYCFC, so I get to see him on a regular basis. And then just to fast forward that, a few years, I, I ended up moving to New York, uh, working for a club in, in, in New York City as a technical director, just uh, as a different avenue with a club called Dusk, which was a great experience, an affiliate of NYCFC. And then my journey from there uh, to join the academy. And like I said, I've been there now uh, going on going on five years and, and during my time with NYCFC, obviously once again, uh, relevant to the, to the topic, development in the pre-professional phase, uh, able to work with another bunch of players that have bridged the gap and moved from you know, elite level academy into the professional ranks. Uh, obviously James being one of them, and then you know, Joe, Joe Scali following him, Justin Hack, Tavon Gray, uh, have all come through our academy, and obviously Gio Reyna, who, who's obviously well known, uh, 
he was now in Dortmund, so I spent a lot of time working with him. So over the, over the years of my you know, coaching experience, I've been very fortunate to work with some, some elite level talent uh, that possess a lot of potential and, and see some, a, a lot of them go on into the professional ranks is, as, as any coach would attest to is, is, the, is the goal. You know, it's what we all strive to in development and uh, you know, very fortunate to have some, some top level players and, and not just players, but obviously top level personalities and, and, and people in order to, to progress and to, to the next level and hopefully they'll continue to do so. Uh, so with that, you know, Sean, I know you had a few questions to go and I know there's a, there's a Q&A board on here. Uh, let me know if you want to open up or you want me to jump on the Q&A board. Um, like I said, I'll, um, I'll start, I guess, because I um, was fortunate to very briefly cross paths with Matt when we were in New York. Um, he was helping with a program at um, Avenues to School there in the arena. Um, and I was coaching at that point as well. So I've been fortunate to see Matt work and see some of the things that Dusk were doing at that time. Um, and I think my question, Kind of revolves around that whole pathway that you mentioned, Matt. I mean, a lot of this came from working with um with Olney over in Maryland. And um, how have you carried that? I guess what was the thing that you saw there that has I guess carried through your your coaching career to this point in terms of the development of players to play at that elite level? Because I think at that point that success rate is phenomenal compared to any other you know amateur youth club in in any country, not just in the US alone. I think first and foremost, you know, the, there was always a level of a base level of talent. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to develop high level professional players if, if there's not a base level of talent. So there's always talent there. And then it's about how you nurture the talent. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of what you can do with, with these elite players is, is just to kind of nurture them. Uh, you don't have to do as much really in, in the development aspect. There's certain players that really development wise, they were so far ahead, you know, of, of other players that you just had to nurture an environment where, they were challenged, you know, they, but they felt safe. Uh, they, they were challenged, but safe. But, and and, you, and you, you wanted to be strong with them and you wanted to, you know, be firm with them and, and get them out of the comfort zone, but you also, you didn't want to be soft with them. So you had to kind of really find a balance to, to kind of get that last part of, of their development right. Uh, and then there becomes a point where there's only so much we can do and, and the environment for them is, is important. They have to move uh, to, to a higher level. And I remember when the Gideons of Ireland, we, we played him up two years and he, every time he played an older team or every competition, it was just far too easy. It was just far, you know, far too beyond at his point in time. So moving across to Arsenal uh, at that point was, was, was what made sense. So, uh, you know, going back to your question, I think I've always also been very fortunate in that, uh, you know, this, there hasn't been pressure to win. So we've been able to experiment. Uh, we've been, always been player development focused. We've always been relevant in, in that regard to, you know, there's no one ever said, listen, you got to win these games. You know, uh, when I coached in Maryland, I uh, had a great group, group of parents, great coaching director, really supportive club where it didn't matter if we win. We didn't win, actually, early on. We, we, we lost a lot. Uh, but we always, we, we saw a long-term vision and the players bought into it and the players stuck together. And, and uh, as a result now, they're, they're all still very connected and a lot of them, are, you know, like I said, I think there's you know, five or six that are still playing professional. Uh, they're still pretty young. Uh, and the same at NYCFC, you know, working for, for, for Claudio, working for the club that, once again, winning was not important. You know, they didn't even look at standings. They didn't look at the USDA standings. They didn't care, you know, whatever ranking we were. Uh, they just wanted to come and see progression. They wanted to see player development. They wanted to see us developing individual players that could play the next level. Uh, and they wanted to see some kind of identity to what it was. So we were always big on that. Like I talked about philosophy is like the culture that's created, you know, togetherness that created, uh, I think, you know, going back if, to, to, to compare both teams, uh, both groups, uh, the togetherness was unbelievable. You know, I've seen many stories about, about that and, and how they kept together, but uh, they stuck together. And the, the bond they had on and off the field was, was really important. And that was something that, that I had to try and nurture. And, and it took time and it took patience. And, uh, you know, the belief system that they all bought into was great. So, you know, that was what I, I could, you know, compare with the two groups. Uh, and, and they were in different, you know, completely different dynamics. One was a small town team in the DC metro area uh, that I coached for a long time throughout the, throughout the age groups. And then with CFC, I've always been in the old stage group. Players have been passed through the system. And, and, and uh, so a little bit different. And it's given me a really good, you know, big scope on what, uh, what it takes to develop players. And also that, that every player is so different. And, it, and what I did with one group, I can't do with the other and vice versa. And even within, you know, two years at NYCFC Academy, we had to really adapt our style 
because of the dynamic and the personnel and the strengths we had uh, within the team. So I think obviously always learning and evolving and, and being willing to change is important, but having a, a clear identity of what we're trying to do and not trying to change, not trying to react too much to, to what's going on around you. So you lose a game, you know, uh, not reacting too much about why and, and, and you win a game and not reacting too much about, you know, getting too com complacent in regard to, to that's that you fixed it. It's always going back to your beliefs and values and, and working and training really hard, uh, sacrificing a lot of time to, to the process. And then if you have, a, a, you know, a, a goal, and we always talk about dreaming, dreaming big, uh, I think that's very important. You mentioned a little bit um, about it, you've got parental buy-in. I mean, this is a big part. I mean, working in a professional academy, it's a little bit easier because um, you're a professional academy. But when you worked in the in the youth club scene, both in New York and in Maryland, how did you how did you manage that? The parent education, the parent buy-in for that vision that was clearly successful, but it can oftentimes not be so easily recognised by the parents in that way. I think early on, it's about educating the parents, you know, I think getting face to face with the parents and, and helping them understand that, you know, you, what you're trying to do is, is for the player's best interest. And I think if you are able to, to open that up early on and, and also have, have guidelines, you know, have guidelines about this is what we're going to do and explain why. Uh, like I said, I was fortunate enough that early on, I didn't have any pressure, so I could really experiment and try and, and and, and watch your team go from not winning to, to winning a lot. Uh, you know, I think if, in other environments, there might be a lot of pressure for people to, to jump and leave and move around. And, and there really wasn't because the core group of, of players uh, believed in it and, and, they, and they enjoyed it and they embodied it. So that was, that side was lucky. And then when I moved through into, into, uh, into New York, it was once again, I had that experience and, and to look back on it and, and, what I discovered was that the education of parents and the communication of parents is important, uh, but also having, having barriers, and, and, but making them understand the, the, the why behind it. You know, the why you don't want necessarily uh, certain parents standing on the trip side watching training because how it affects their child. And I had a lot of examples. I had a lot of really good examples about players that are now playing professional, but, uh, you know, going back to one example was many years ago, we were playing in a, you know, national tournament, national finals, I uh, can't remember the year, but they were, you know, 17, 18, and one of our players literally could not focus the whole game, and he was, he, he was kicking the ball out of play, he was tripping over it, he, and he was all over the place, and, and this player now plays, plays in the professional league, he's played the highest level, uh, national team, etc. and, you know, I asked him, what was going on? And during the game, you know, there was a lot of fans, and the, and the other team had a lot of support, screaming and shouting the whole game. And through all that noise, all he heard was, it was, was one of his parents uh, who was doing it to protect him because she felt the pressure, she wanted to help him, uh, she wanted to nurture him, she was the mother, you know, protected her child. Uh, and she'll admit she didn't really know that much about the game, she just knew, she just cared for her son. All he heard through hundreds of people on the sideline was his mother and he had an absolute shock over the game and he that minute and afterwards he explained why and we talked about it, we talked to, you know, I talked to his parents. And they took it on board, you know, his mother completely took it on board. But that was an example of, of what, you know, parents were, she wasn't understanding what, what the impact she would have on his performance. Uh, so I had a lot of anecdotal stories and examples throughout time that resonated with parents. Uh, and I think, once again, just educating the parents on, on, on the importance of certain things uh, is, is important. So that was very helpful for me in regard to, to getting, to having time to get myself to allow time for me to, to get the players to a point and the team to a point where they were uh, successful, you know, and they were connected and they were together and, they, and they, were, they were really bought into the process. You mentioned a little bit about that there was no pressure to win. Um, but obviously, I mean, I share that vision and that, that ideology as well and we try and work in that in the same way. But how, how have you managed to create a competitive environment for the players outside of that you know, I guess pressure to win in games. Is it through the training environment you create? Is it how do you manage that aspect of what you're doing and how did you in these arenas in the past? Yeah, I mean I don't really transmit to the players there's no pressure to win, you know. Uh I just try and develop an identity within a with a group of players and a style that that is risky and is brave and, and you know building out of the back at times and uh you know doing things you know overloading and, and leaving leaving gaps at times to 
to overload in tackle areas. So they were, I never put the pressure on them to win, but I developed, I created, you know, always in training, everything was about winning and competing and, and, and doing your best and being accountable. Uh, and if they didn't win, then, you know, in a game, you know, it wasn't the end of the world as long as they, you know, put the effort forth. But in the training environment, we created a lot of things, age-specific, of course, where, you know, that five sides, you know, three sides, whatever it is, you know, one v ones, uh, where it actually was very, very competitive. You know, where they they hated to lose, uh, and they would do anything to, to to win, and we rewarded that that mentality. So we within the environment, we always create a very strong winning mentality uh, in all age groups. Uh, you know, especially in the older age groups, and that's why we also try and. I also try and test them always. I, you know, I put them in situations where they will lose. You know, you say you're going on a you know five six winning streaks. You know, and, and understanding that eventually that bubble will burst when the timing of that. So I would always you know maybe be cognizant of okay, we've got these games coming up. We're winning a lot. They're getting complacent. Uh, now how do I reset them? Because you know a month later maybe there's there's a playoff game or maybe there's a big tournament. You know, in the older ages that we do want to win. Uh, you know, a Dallas Cup back in the day or a GA Cup, you know, in the current situation or playoffs, etc. the DA. So I would then try and scrimmage, you know, try and get a game against a high level men's team or play, if they were younger, play an older team uh, to challenge them, to really get them out of their comfort zone and just to reset them and to humble them a little bit and, and always look to play older teams, always look to play international teams as much as you could. And any time that we would go and play, and we, we, you know, both groups took took opportunities to go and play in Europe, and uh, and it was great because you know there was no pressure to win. But we we'd come back from those those games, and our level of intensity and our speed of play and our competitiveness was was three four times higher uh, that we couldn't replicate on a on a weekly basis. And I would say that those op- those kind of opportunities and those trips really pro- allow players to progress and develop at a faster rate. So that's, I have a big belief in that, in having players be challenged, you know, in, in, in playing all the teams, always playing all the teams when it's obviously safe. Uh, look to now play the men's teams as much as we can. We look to try and play college teams right now as much as we can. You know, any experience against the first team as much as we can uh, is value, so valuable. And, and you would also, we would, you know, when, when we played a, a team that was, you know, a professional academy team from a foreign country, you would see the, the players that could make it to the next level. And that, for me, was a great, great snapshot of, okay, this player, fantastic every week, but the level of competition is not great. Now they're playing against, you know, Real Madrid or Liverpool. Uh, how, do they, how do they raise their level? And, and the top players that, that did go on to, to play or are playing professional, they were the ones that they could adapt. You know, the speed of play, they could adapt. You know, uh, the pressure they could adapt. The limited time on the ball, they could adapt. And the players that could adapt were the ones that stood out. And it also it reinforced that, yes, this player has what it takes to go to the next level. What do we need to do next? You know, because the current environment is not enough for them. How do we challenge them again? So as much as we can, we try and get them out of the comfort zone as much as they can. We, we play all the teams, you know, we try and play all, all the teams. And at times, you know, the only Rangers team, we play all the teams two, three years up. And it still wasn't enough, so we had to really get creative, uh, you know, to 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 do that. And, and we'd rotate positions, and we just to get them used to being uncomfortable, so that when the time came in a, in a pressure environment where they had to be comfortable, they had to be able to, to cope with the demands of pressure. They they'd been through it, so that you know that's a real challenge. Uh, I think within within the dynamic of of uh, the U.S. soccer landscape because it's such a such a big country, uh, and especially when you have you know, top, top talent, uh, how, how do you do that? So that's something that, that is still an ongoing challenge for us uh, day to day. And it, over time, it's always been, and I've been, you know, lucky enough to have the opportunity to take the teams to different environments and to challenge them in those ways. You mentioned overloads and leaving gaps. On that note, I'm going to hand it over to the Q&A board. And one of the presenters from last week, Dominic from Holston Keel, has actually asked a question of you, Matt. Um, he's asked, what is more important? individual goals or team goals, referring back to the individual development planning, do you think that it is not critical to set a goal like scoring the five goals first half of the season that the player you um, you showed had as one of his goals? I think it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit dependent on uh, 
the environment and, and the club and, and you know, our, our goal is to develop professional players. So, you know, we're not necessarily looking to develop the team. We're looking to develop individual players within a team and understanding that team, you know, can carry an individual. Uh, I think it's important that we, we, we really work on both of them, but we don't sacrifice an individual for the sake of the team, you know? So we have to look at a player. An example would be a player that needs to play up. You know, a player that needs to play up may not be at that moment in time as effective as a player that's two, three years older and physically develops, uh, but they've, they've hit their, their peak. So we may then have to look at this player now and say, okay, we'll put this, this player in who's three years younger. He may not be as effective right now. We may not win this game because uh, he's still got a long way to go. But in three years, this player will be way ahead and on a professional pathway, whereas this other player who's already physically at his peak will not. So, you know, that's why with regard to the individual development uh, in, in my current domain is, is really important. And, you know, I, I, if you have a, a bunch of talent, which, which with both groups that have been referenced and with the last two national championship winning teams with NYCFC, we had a lot of talent. So we didn't have to focus on maybe the one or two top players. We could focus on the seven or eight top players. So in essence, we, we ended up focused, the, the team kind of led the development a lot of times. Uh, but if, if it comes a point where we only have two or three elite talents and the rest of the team uh, we don't see as that level, then we have to cater and move and work really solely focused on, on the individual player. So uh, I think you can work both for sure. And we don't neglect players that uh, we don't think are going to be pros because we think they, they deserve the best uh, development opportunities. And they can also then aid the development of what we do see as a potential uh, elite talent. Uh, and setting individual goals, I think, is also just part of part of the process, and that is is fine. You know, I think it's it's part of uh, what what a player needs to strive towards. Whether the the goals are uh, you know metric or whether they are more based on like their development of a certain skill, uh, I think e either can be kind of pushed in a certain way. So the player reference he set a target of five goals. Uh, you know, so about okay, how do we what, we can spin that in the regard to how effective are you are in the final third? You know, uh, are you getting to the right position to score? You know, if you're playing in this area, are you getting the right position to score? And if not, can we improve that? And then will in turn this improve your opportunity to score goals? And then can we work on your, on your finishing? So that is just kind of a, a, you know, a goal that we can then link back to the development of, of that specific player. Has that kind of got geared towards the player being participating in a goal setting process to become more invested and engaged in the process? And, and you guys can extrapolate from that, like you mentioned, how he wants to score five plus goals. We can make that about being more effective in the final third and, and getting into goal scoring um, areas. Is that kind of how you would link yeah, it? To yeah, 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 one hundred percent. Yeah. That, uh, so, like I said, we can we can guide these these IVPs. We can, if a player you know wants to score goals, then we have to look at okay, so how can we score goals, you know? Say if the player, the, the nine's like, great finisher, but doesn't really want to work, but we want to press. So we will then, you know, we'll break down the ability to, to press as a group and how now we can win the ball higher up, which in essence, then we can hopefully create more chances and then you will score more goals. So we'll, we'll look, we'll use those as a way to spin what we want to get out of players. And so we get buy-in. So th yeah, they're putting down often what they think is important, and we will often then look to spin with them. Okay, you want to score more goals? You're a forward, great. And, and you can score goals, but you're only scoring goals when someone's you know, putting you in a goal or someone's crossing the ball to you or basically uh, there's some kind of set piece. But we're not scoring goals now in, in transition and we're not scoring goals of winning the ball up high in, in, when we're pressing. So if you want to score goals, then buy into this process. This is what we do as a team. This is what we can develop. And then in essence, in turn, you will score more goals. Um, Gary has asked, it's a great idea that the under-19s mirror the first team in preparation to set up for that level, but does the club or the city group dictate in any way to the first team coach and manager what that club philosophy, philosophy must be and what they must fit into? Um, and how does that impact on your role as phase lead and the U19 coach? Ultimately, every manager you know, will, will determine their style and their, and their identity. However, you know, when, when they're looking to bring in managers, there has to be some kind of track record on how they want to play. So 
I don't think the, 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 the group would hire someone who's maybe long known for a certain style that's not connected to the to what, what we're looking to do with the city group. So uh, so that being said, and and if the first team, you know, early on at times didn't have the the players that that uh, maybe Patrick Vieira wanted to, to press a certain way, he had to he had to wait. He had to press a you know, you know, that David Vieira obviously a fantastic player. Is he a focal point of the press? Probably not. You know, you don't want him to expend his energy at least that point of his career. So you want players around him that can do that. So I know that the, the, the first team evolved into a more high energy, dynamic pressing group over time once they get the, the right players in that can maybe help press around uh, David Villa. And, and, he, and he had the capability to do that. They just wanted to maybe manage his, his, his area of doing that. So when we decided to mirror the first team, and this was you know, halfway through the season, we weren't a high pressing team because we just had so many young players. Uh, we were by far the youngest team in our, in our, in our age group. Uh, we had a lot of basically under 16s playing under 19s. And when we went to try and go win the ball back, it was a lot of physical overload. It was, it was, it was very risky at times. It wasn't highly effective. Uh, and the players struggled because it was, it was at times too much. So we had to layer that. So we decided that, okay, well, over the winter time, we had the time to do this. So we, the transition part of the season, we worked on it all the time. And we basically said, we met with, the, you know, I met with Patrick and we sat down and, and they, how they pressed and they were going, they were just going to start the season. They were going to start pressing. So I thought, you know what, we're going to do the same. And if it doesn't work, then fine. We'll challenge them. We'll get them out of the comfort zone. Uh, listen, if you get, if a press gets broken, if for the first month it doesn't work, we'll get fitter. We'll get more used to it. We'll get more connected. We'll be challenged more. We'll be out of our comfort zone. We may not win every game, which is not, not the end of the world at this point in time. Uh, and so we decided to do that. So we decided to, to take that on. And that changed a little bit of dynamic because we were, we were a little bit predictable. Uh, you know, we, when we played certain teams, we were a bit predictable at how we were going to play. And this added a new dimension. Uh, and even all the way through from, from you know, when we started that in the winter, all the way through to the summer, when we, when we beat LA Galaxy on penalties, and even in the final, you know, against a very highly talented team, a lot of top, top level players who are, who are still playing now in, in, the ne in the next level, we still went out and pressed. Uh, and we pressed a certain way that was difficult and we pressed a certain way that actually, you know, we learned from, from the first team. Uh, you know, similar to what Liverpool do with the, the kind of a flat three midfield and, and, the, and the, the, white, you know, the, the, the eight and 10, so to speak, would go and press the fullbacks. Uh, we adapted. So we, we really took on what the first team were doing and because they had a style that was development-based, you know. Uh, they played a style that they liked to build from the back, religiously, Patrick Vieira liked to build from the back, which is great for development. So, yeah, we remember that. They liked to go press high and engage and go win the ball back. Great for development, let's go do that. So, if their style was different and it was just route one, long ball, get on the second balls, or it was, you know, low blocking, then we wouldn't have taken that up. Uh, we would have, we would have con continu continued with our development process. But a lot of it matched up with what we look, wanted to do and we just tweaked it to a higher level. Uh, and then we adapted just, you know, we adapted to do the uh, to zonal defend because we thought it would challenge them. And then if they ended up being a pro and having to do a zone defend, they've at least done it. They've learned it. You know, we, we, we switched sometimes a set piece to what we've done in the past uh, to do a bit, a bit of man marking, a bit of zonal, a little bit of both, more so to prepare them for the next level. Not because we maybe thought one was more effective than the other. Now that's, what we always look to do. And, and like I said, going back to the first team staff, we've been very lucky with the first team staff that have always been brought on because they want to play a certain way. And that, that way is, you know, it's dynamic, it's creative, it's, it's attractive, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, development based. So as, as, a, as an academy, we're very fortunate that we, we can mirror that. And we can mirror that. And, and if we mirror that to a certain extent, we can help develop players. When it comes to developing those players, and finding that they're ready for that next level. Who's the who's the driver in that decision making process? Do you guys push it, or do they? Is there a link between the first team and your group that, that kind of facilitates that, or do you push that from your end? It's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, Claudio created a really open, uh, you know, communicative platform, very strongly connected uh, staff. So we would link. You know the. the the older age, age group coaches would discuss with the, with the uh, sporting director and the 
academy director, we'd have discussions. We'd always have, you know, we'd have uh, charts on, on players and where we think they're at. And, and then once again, when they would, they would watch our games. We'd, we'd go and do an international tournament. We'd review who the top players were. Uh, and then it, ultimately we, we try and get these players into a pre-season opportunity or when the first team came knocking, we need, we need a defender. We send the players that we thought would, would be ready for the next level. So organically, the first team got familiar with these players and we weren't pushing, okay, you got to send this player. So, okay, this player can help you in training. And then they would come back and say, oh yeah, this, we like this player. This is why. Or no, we prefer this player. So, over time, it was just a constant uh, up and down, you know, training with the first team and, and the, the number of opportunities that players have had with the first team is, is unbelievable. So even though, you know, those early years when the kids were 14, 15, 16, they'd be up there for a week at a time because it was an international break and, and they wanted to fill in the 12 players that were missing with 12 academy players. You know, it might have been eight, it might have been five. Uh, and so they had so much experience that they got to know the players. And then when they went on pre-season, we would recommend the players for pre-season. They would then pick the ones that they knew were comfortable with, position-based, numbers-based, etc. And before signing a player, everyone in the club, everyone involved in the process from the academy into the first team are well aware of these players' capabilities, well, well aware of the dynamic of this player, you know. Uh, their, their strengths, their weaknesses, their, you know, their age group, their, their background, etc. Uh, and so that ultimately it's a collective decision that is made you know, with the first team staff and obviously the sporting director, uh, ultimately, but it's it's something that happens over time. And, and, and the academy, especially in the older age groups, you know, myself and the older age groups, coaches and the, and the academy director, they're all involved in the process of who do we want to push? Who do we think is, is, is the next potential pro? Uh, but we ultimately don't make that decision. That's, that comes from uh, the first team. But it, like I say, it's very collective. It's very uh, open lines of communication. And it happens a little bit organically with the time that the players are able to, to spend. You know, each of our homegrowns, I would say, have probably, probably spent, and even James just went to pre-season to help out initially, you know, spent 30, you know, probably been exposed to 30 opportunities with the first team before they've even been signed. Mentioned, uh, touched on what you mentioned in reference to the, the space you guys have. Obviously, New York is kind of a different animal space and field availability so they're kind of working how do you work that space and and as your u19 group how how much time do you get allocated each week in terms of and what space do you have to use with the with the group uh yeah ch challenge to say the least so it, it's changed to be honest we've had to keep adapting and changing it to try and find a better formula uh initially you know we had we had the one team and then we had the two teams so it wasn't really an issue and then when we went from two to six that became an issue and uh, we have three time slots. So ultimately the, the oldest team gets the latest slot, uh, which it's tough for them getting home late. I mean, it's such a massive commitment on the players' parts there and the families, the amount of driving they have to do. Uh, obviously think about New York traffic. We train in Queens at St. John's University. We have that facility, uh, which is you know a good facility, big turf field with lights. So we're lucky that we have that facility to, to operate in. Uh, there's other facilities we can use, uh, but that's our, our base. And at this moment in time, that the the 19s train late, they get the full field uh, most of the time, and the, but they train late. So the trade off is full field train late. We used to have them where they would have half a field. Uh, I mean, believe it or not, the first year we won the national uh, championship, we, we trained on half a field. Uh, and then once again, like adaptability, you know. That's something that we we possess within the New York City uh, Football Club. The, the adaptability of these players, uh, the, you know, space is always at a premium. You know, we train late, uh, long hours in the car. Some players, you know, traveling an hour, sometimes up to two hours each way, four nights a week. Uh, we've had to adapt, and at times we drop it down. We give them a night off. We give them some time off. We we try and figure out. We leave earlier. You know to go prepare uh, something we've adapted to is instead of maybe spending longer training, we will leave a day earlier and get an extra session in and acclimatize uh, so that they're not sat in a car for as much longer time. So we've, we've managed to evolve over time and adapt to what we do, but in essence, we don't have always access to full space. You know, uh, we, 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 we do now try and push the 19s to have a field, you know, three times a week full field for at least an hour. 
Uh, but it means, you know, the 17s, the 15s are sharing, the 13s and 14s are sharing. Uh, and we have the limited opportunity at times to maybe host, host games. So we've had to adapt. We've had to get really creative uh, in, in the times where we have to go and organize additional activities for them. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, for us, less is more. Sometimes giving them a break, you see they come back hungry, you know. Uh, and then in, in situations where, we are under the gun, you know, we have 10 men, we have to adapt or we have to get grinding result out or we have to get through extra time or we have to show the mentality to, to perform in PKs. I think the challenge we have on a day-to-day -day basis actually helps these players, you know, and, and yeah, in an ideal world, we have, you know, three or four pitches, lights, turf, grass, locker rooms, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the goal, hopefully, at one point. But what we what we're able to do and we spin it you know we we don't feel sorry for ourselves we, we're we new yorkers so we have to kind of push that with the players and if we have a third of the field for an hour then we adapt and we make it as be, you know, best environment we can uh and we have to make sure the players want to be there and they love being there for the most part they do and when we see that that's kind of tapering off and they're exhausted from their academic studies their physical load the games program the travel i might give them a couple of days off uh, and I think that's something we've learned over time that, that, you know, early on, we were really trying to push so much and we had a little bit of mental, physical exhaustion. So we just, we, we kind of pull it back. Uh, and there's certain times of year when we have more space, more time in the summertime, you know, is, is we're actually changing the day. And uh, we actually do better at those times of the year, which is why I think we have some success towards the end of the year is that, you know, uh, we have more space and time and the, and the boys a little bit more relaxed at that moment and less stressed and, and less tired. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it is a challenge, uh, one hundred percent. It is, but like I said earlier in the in the discussion, we're fortunate we have the talent uh, to work with, and, and I think we we take that over talent over space any day. And yeah, well, you showed a little bit about the plan at the moment in this obviously current situation, which is very difficult, but and long term. But obviously, in the northeast, there's a number of other challenges that you guys face and weather and, and, and why is and that. Is that how, how do you guys plan around that in terms of that you utilize that for game analysis, video? What do you do in those situations where unexpected like situations arise where you can't train? Yeah, in the winter we go, we, we rent a bubble, uh, Columbia University, we have some bubble space. We, we train in the cold a lot. <laughs> like I say, we, you know, uh, we've been fortunate actually with, with the weather over the last few few winters hasn't been too bad uh but yeah we have to get creative you know we, we different age groups do different things uh we we try and get them involved as much as possible with uh you know pre-season with the first team and that allows us to do extra stuff so that you know when the, when the mls break and, and we have we actually have access to our first team facility uh and the first team are fantastic in allowing us to use that at times so during the season, it's difficult, but in, in, in the winter season, we can use that a little bit more. Uh, we can get small groups up. Uh, you know, this, this leading into this preseason, we, we had, with our first team coach in place, we actually had the, the access to the facility where some of the first team players were up there training, and, they, and we threw in a bunch of our, our young academy players to, to work with them, you know, because there was only a handful. So things like that where we get creative, uh, a lot of IDP stuff, you know, a lot of video stuff uh, with regard to the, uh, you know, the development of players. We'll work more of that. We'll try and do some trips where they can get, get away. And, uh, and during the trips is where we can do a little bit more in regards to like, you know, double sessions. Uh, like I said, we always try and leave a little bit earlier. Once again, very fortunate. We, we have the budget to be able to maybe go a day or so earlier where we can get a couple of sessions in, acclimatize, relax. And then when the competition starts, we're a little bit more prepared. Uh, and then once again, just being adaptable, uh, you know, thunderstorms, snowstorms, uh, pandemics, all of those things, uh, like I say, the New Yorkers have to be really adaptable in their, in their realm. And we have players that are, have access to, you know, a nice big backyard. And we have players that live in a really small Bronx apartment and, and have access to a hallway right now. Uh, so, but they're, they're strong mentally because they've had to go through this over time. And uh, I think not having everything in regard to, you know, resources, facilities, space, time, etc., cetera, uh, hardens them a little bit. It makes them a little bit hungrier and it makes them want to fight a little bit more for, for what they can get out of it. So uh, I think that, once again, we can spin that in a positive. Uh, and we are, you know, we're looking to obviously increase and build our, our 
our facility out. We, we, we obviously want our own academy home at some point uh, with ideally a bubble, uh, turf, grass, lights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's just it's taking a little bit longer than, we, than everyone had anticipated and hoped. Obviously, there's a bit of a, a roadblock right now. And, and, you know, like I say, back to your question, it's, uh, it's important that players are able to adapt in, in any environment. And we, we, we're fortunate that we have a, a strong group of players and coaches that can do so. In terms of the, the values and behaviours you mentioned, um, is, that a, is that a club-wide thing? Or is that something that you've developed as part of your coaching plan? And, and, or does it trickle down through the whole academy? Does every coach have their own flexibility to create their own values and behaviours that want to be in their group? Or is it mandated? This is, uh, this is a, a kind of a working document that we've, we've started in the past year. We had uh, Liam Manning just joined us from West Ham. He brought a lot of the IDP stuff with him, which was fantastic. And then previously Rodrigo Marion was, was the director. He's now a full-time coach. And they, they've always been very big on, on the values and the culture. Uh, so it's something that has been done collectively over time with the staff. The staff are at the forefront. Uh, they have to embody it. They have to believe in it. So they kind of lay it out. Uh, once again, it evolves. You know, it's, it's, it's ever-evolving. It's an ever-evolving you know, piece of work. So, but that, the, the culture and the values that I embody are part of what, the academy embodies, and it's part of what we want to uh, push onto the players, and and we have to live it as well. You know, we have to be respectful to it, and we have to live it. So the elite behavior is there as something that we believe that that will help the non-negotiables and the fundamentals that I showed earlier are there in everything we do. Uh, and then obviously we have we have the creativity to to adapt and change. So you know, one thing that that we focused on with with the 19s this year was we came up with with a you know, after we'd laid all this out, it, within the group, we came up, okay, what do we want to look like? You know, what do you, we're, we're a unique group of players. What do you want to look like? Uh, what do you want the elite behavior and identity of the group to be within this framework? Uh, you know, they came up with, you know, just being brave, uh, you know, high energy in, in everything, everything they do. Uh, and they want to be together, you know. So there's, there's a certain amount of guiding that we can do with that, you know. You talk about what do you want to get across and, and who you are and, and, and you can guide that so that, Maybe at times that's a bit more simple and it's a bit more uh, relevant. But all the culture, all the values, all the elite behaviours is everything that we, that we put forth is, is driven by the staff, it's, it's, it's created by the staff. Uh, we have a really, really good uh, staff pool. Uh, you know, Liam's been a great addition in, in regard to connecting everything and delivering everything. And, and, you know, earlier today I was, you know, on a call for two hours with, a guy, with the staff and, and we do daily, weekly calls uh, you know, it's very open. It's a flat hierarchy. It's all clean feedback at all times, and we're always looking to push and challenge each other. And there is a really, really strong uh, connection between the staff, and I think that is why we've had success uh, in not only developing players but success on the field. Uh, and it's why that we we have a little bit of a unique identity in regards to what we can deliver uh, at times. You know, within within the academy landscape. Yeah. Question from a mutual friend of ours, Matt, Stuart Fan. He then um, asked, older teenagers can be emotional as the brain is not fully developed. What support do you have to help them build resilience and control or build mental strength? Yeah, for sure. Uh, very emotional. Thanks, Stuart, for that question. Hope you're well. I think part of it is, you know, you have to, you have to lead by example. So, you know, the emotion aspects and, and, you know, players are so emotional and, you know, especially when they're not used to losing. So you have a talented group of players. How do they cope with losing? How do they cope with adversity? And initially it's very difficult, you know, you get a lot of fallout, you get a lot of blame. Uh, so we always, we, we always embody like, okay, we, 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 we blame inwards. We start with ourselves, you know, uh, we, we discuss everything and we're in this together, uh, big on togetherness, you know, and also the staff, the staff have to do this. If, if we're shouting and screaming and ranting and raving on the sideline, kicking every ball, uh, kicking coolers, throwing water bottles, shouting at the ref, the players see this and the players take this on. So, you know, often the, the emotional uh, sideline, you know, it, you know, even from parents, and I know there's a lot of uh, youth coaching on the call, so you have an emotional sideline that, from parents that, that now transmits through the players. You have an emotional sideline from the coaches' staff that transmits, transmits to the players. You end up with highly emotional players during the game. Uh, and that is a recipe for disaster because you cannot sustain that. You know, you cannot sustain you know, success at all times. 
So how do we cope with not winning? Uh, and that's when, when bad things start to happen. So I always try and remain as calm and composed as possible. There's been instances that I've learned from actually, you know, as a young coach, I learned a lot on, on the field. I learned a lot like in action and on action and reflection on, you know, why we lost. And like I said, early on, we lost a lot. And, and I, I always try to re- reflect on why. And, and at times it was maybe my emotional instability, you know, overreactive, shouting at the refs, not focusing on the game. Uh, so I've really learned to kind of put that aside and be very composed and as calm as possible. Even if on the inside, I don't necessarily always feel that way. That's what I try and transmit. So I try and transmit that to the players so the players feel secure, the f- players feel safe, uh, the players feel that they are protected. And there's examples where, where you have to stand up for your players at times. You know, there's examples that, you know, I recently heard a po- podcast from Jake Rosansky, who a player I coached for many years, and he had Jeremy Bobasi on there, and they were, they were giving examples uh, of their time together. Uh, and, you know, there was always that together so protection that they felt. They felt safe. They felt safe in our environment and under myself as a coach and but with one another. So uh, it takes time to nurture that, uh, but you have to embody it. You have to live it and you have to lead, lead by example. So you can help at times with the emotional instability of players by, by nurturing that. And also you can give them experiences where they ask, they are going to fail. They, you set them up to fail so that they come back stronger. Uh, and you can do that by playing all the teams where the expectation is not to win a game. You're playing all the teams. You have a little bit of, of a little bit of an excuse, so to speak. Although you know we don't want excuses, but uh, are you playing in an international tournament and, and the levels are really high and these you know professional players involved? So you have something to go back on. So you give them the opportunities to fail so that then they can get mentally stronger. Uh, and if you see them always dominating, then you have to find ways to. To, to manage that and, and, and to tweak that so that they can they can learn uh, they can learn to lose at times they can learn to fail and they can come a little bit stronger so that's what I work towards understanding that each age group is completely different at U19 for the most part they're less emotional uh, you, you know go down to U15 and, and you know as a, as a phase lead now I spend a lot of time observing the 15s and 17s and the 19s and emotionally at U15 it's, it's so different than the 19s so there has to be a different uh, level of, of management there, you know, it's a bit more at times maybe nurture, uh, but there has to be a certain level of clean feedback. So you hold them accountable, but maybe you figure out a way that, that each player is also a little bit different. So maybe one player might crumble if you if you make an example or you, or you talk about them in front of the group. So you may have to you may have to spin that differently. You might have to be more individual. Some need the arm on the shoulder approach. Uh, some need a kick of the backside. Each one's a little bit different. So spending time to get to know the players. And also listening to the players and, and, and you know, observing. You know, I think uh, going back to one, one, one coach, you know, uh, that I really respect over time, you know, Alex Ferguson, I read a lot about him. His, his ability when he, when he became in Man United was to step back and observe, uh, observe players and, and it really improved his man management. I think is really important. Even at the youngest age, it was just, you know, during the warm up, step back and observe, you know, get, get stuff set up so you're not rushing around. You know, you give them time to do their own thing, little rondos as, as they get going, and you step back and observe, and you see, you see who the leaders are, you see who, who's high in confidence, low in confidence, uh, and then you start to build uh, the development for each player individually within the team dynamic, and you, and you figure out what, what's needed. And like I said, each player is unique, each team is unique. It's not a one cap fit all. You have to be constantly changing and evolving. And, and uh, but I think, you know, in essence, having emotional stability yourself will help the players with their emotional state. Thanks, Matt. I think you may have answered this partially in the next one, but we'll give it one last question and then we'll, we'll let you go for the night. Well, for the day here, I guess, in the UK, it would be night time. Um, a couple of people asked, yeah, people are coming and they're just starting their coaching journey. Um, what would be one piece of advice you would give to encourage them to keep progressing? Or what one real key coaching aspect, be that psychologically or mentally or tactically. Would you, would you give us advice to these guys to ensure that they do keep progressing and developing as coaches? Yeah, uh, like I said, I was very lucky that, you know, I, I went, I joined a club where the, the, the director was very supportive. You know, there was very little pressure. We had a good parent group. Uh, so I was fortunate that I had, I had time and I, and I, you know, I was able to stay 
to the course, so to speak. Uh, and that's not always the case. So, but I would say that, you know, we, like players, you know, like coaches, often everyone's looking for the next best thing. Like what's out there? What can I do? Uh, and sometimes it just takes time. You know, I think it takes time to, to play your trade, to be in a, in, a, in a safe, secure environment where you can try things, uh, get some consistency, be patient. Don't, not always looking for the next best thing, I think, so that you can actually play your trade. Uh, and then, you know, taking the time to, to educate yourself. Uh, you know, you take, the, the, the licensing process is, is arduous, it's long. Uh, if you think about the end goal, it's, it, it's, it's almost you know, impossible to, to think that far ahead. So just start small. And then also, you know, like, you know, as much as you can, try and get out there and observe in, in different environments. Try, try and observe uh, maybe people in your domain that you might respect. Uh, you know, look, try and find some mentors that can help along the way. I think massively it's, it's uh, I was mostly learning, you know, by mistakes uh, because I had the time to do that, you know, and now I have some good people around me who, who can, who can help me through the process and, and they can, uh, instead of me having to always go through mistakes and reflect on what I've done is now I have people who can clean me, give me feedback on what, I, what I'm doing well and what I can improve on. And I think having, you know, a safe environment and having good people around you where you can do that will help uh, because there's no right or wrong. Uh, you know, there's going to be challenges along the way. Obviously, you never, no one's ever going to win everything. So uh, how do we deal with, with that, the adversity of that? And then each age group is, is obviously very different in the regards of what is, what is needed, you know, from the younger age groups all the way up through the older age groups. There's, there's different levels of, of uh, development requirements and individual versus the team and, and winning versus development so it's uh it's like, like i say it's, it's no one kept fits all every 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 situation is is unique but i think patience time uh trust in the process uh you know being humble and hard working and, and open to feedback and asking questions i think this time you know uh, with the with the pandemic going on is allowed a lot of people to to sit back and reflect and also now uh like this call, for instance, you know, I've, I've done a lot of Q and A's where I've been on the other side and, and I've learned, you know, been a lot of these that Sean has ran and you get to really uh, learn a lot more about, you know, uh, coaching philosophies, the ins and out of the game because we have the time. And I think in our daily lives, we, we, we're so busy. I think we need to find the time to, to, to continue to, to learn from others, to educate ourselves, uh, to sit back and watch the game, to observe people in action. And, and to trust the process and work through the process over time. Thanks for that, Matt. And um, yeah, a really great presentation. We've had some terrific feedback already and we've had a lot of questions. What I'll do is I will kind of amalgamate them and see if we can get them to you in another way to answer any questions that people may have. Um, and to everyone who was able to attend today, thank you for your time as always. And Matt, thank you again for your time. It's um, been super valuable and I think it's really, again, as always, enlightening to all of us who are involved. So thank you for your time and thank you guys for attending. Thank you, Sean. All the best, everyone.